So I just finished the slides. Five minutes, I think I finished them five minutes ago. There's a paper, so anything I'm missing from here, uh, uh, the, you, you can uh, glean off the paper. Uh, this work actually, the source of this work is uh, Forces Working Group at the ITF. My cohort uh, is DJ, I know he missed his flight, so he must be sitting somewhere here. Um, so, uh, but, but, but let me just jump. So the basic uh, premise is you start with, and I'm not going into how, what this graph is supposed to be. Shit, is this thing working? Yeah. So you start with, say, a policy graph of some form. You know, here's a classifier followed by a series of actions with branches, etc. So if I have a TC classifier action that looks like that, I'm not going into details of what each of these blobs is, but it could be a classifier or an action. Right. That's the starting point. Uh, I can take that. So sometimes the main problem is I have a machine that's slow. This doesn't scale. And slow is relative. Uh, if I want to do a million flows uh, and an x86 doesn't uh, cut it anymore, I would like not to be able to change the policies, but rather scale by adding horizontally another machine. Th that's one of the use cases. So what you do is you take this graph and from a policy perspective decide, I want to chop it off maybe right here and move this to another machine. Right? So while I said it's a machine, and it's actually my test cases typically involve containers. I have container one, container two, and I can chain them. I can have, uh, this could be an if else, another container over there. I, I, I have a small uh, diagram I'm gonna show. So the, so as you can see, this diagram is actually now chopped with the two, uh, these three items here, and the triangle moved to another machine. So th th that's the whole purpose of this. Um, for this to work, you need to be able to take uh, packet data as well as packet metadata that's internal to Linux. So for example, I think I'm gonna pull this off. So for example, things as simple as SKB marks or contract uh, values of some form or other, and you wanna make sure that they go on the wire right there. So when they come in over here, you strip them off, attach them to the SKB or to the contract or to whatever internal structure. And then the graph proceeds internally as if it was initiated in the same machine. Right, so in order for that to work, you need to be able to distribute metadata as well as you need to make sure that the number of edges and the node vertex on each node vertex don't change. By that I mean if you look at any of these colored nodes, whatever vertices, whatever edges that existed before don't change. So let's just pick one, for example, this guy. There was something coming in something that may have branched to the yellow node or may have branched to this colorful node here. If you go back, you can see, yes, there's something coming in from the red guy and something going to the yellow and to this guy, right? So you wanna maintain the edge, the edges to the node, so just simple graph theory, and you wanna maintain the number of vertices that are connected to this guy. They have to be the same, right? So. So those are the two requirements, and they're met by this uh, TC action, basically. Uh, this was the main uh, use case that we were going after. Like I said, we wanted to systolically, uh, uh, horizontally scale the processing. This is packet processing, typically within the same frame or chassis or room. Well, not to say that this could not be used across uh, networks, but it's intended to be within the scope of a single domain, right? So you have packets coming in and then you decide, okay, I'm gonna keep adding new boards over here, right? So the IFE action sits, and this is a simple graph which shows just piping of actions and classifiers, but nothing's stopping you from having branches there or, or loops even. Uh, so it comes to the IFE action which then distributes it across different nodes. And of course you could build, you could keep scaling. Your load balancing algorithm or whatever is built into your policy that programs the IFE. Uh, and the return path, 
and, you, and responses could be coming back the same way they get demultiplex, demultiplex, and go back there. Right, does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so, uh, so while I showed that what we, our main interest was in systolic processing, like, you know, we want to scale. We want to just keep adding blades, and I use the same policies everywhere. It's transparent to the user, and I'm just scaling by getting more compute results out of a uh, cluster of these things. Uh, there are other use cases. One is uh, OEM info encoding. For example, you may want to trace a flow. So you can attach to it uh, debug information. Or you may want to do exception service handling. For example, uh, VXLAN uh, 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 service uh, exception handling, basically. You may want to do authentication and authorization information. You may want to encode that in there, send something to some packets to a quarantine a node that then validates them and, and uh, systemically uh, keep adding this info and authorizing the packets across the node and then you install a rule to bypass the authentication. Uh, you could just have versioning info that, look, this other guy is running version 0 0.1, you're running 0 0.2. Compliance info, again, it's probably related to the authentication authorization where you quarantine some packets until you're happy with them, then you remove the rule for them. I'm sure there's other use cases, but these are ones I've come across. Okay, so how do you set up this, ac this action? Uh, one way, so you need two nodes. If I go back to this diagram here, you see there's, an, there's a source node on the ingress port of that source node, you attach an IFE action. And on the ingress queue disk of this node, you attach another IFE action. So essentially, this uh, TC rule shows the uh, ingress side. Uh, you basically match. And I have a test case that I used typically run with ICMP. So I'm going to match on, if I see any IP packet, uh, protocol 10, I, I give it a priority of 10. I'm going to match for IP protocol 1, which is IX, ICMP. And I'm going to run a bunch of actions, but one of the other actions that I want to run is this IFE. So on the egress side, I'm telling it to encode. So, uh, and some of these things are sort of optional, but I added them here for clarity reasons. As an example, I could say I wanted to use an ether type of 0x dead. So there has to be synchronization between the source and the destination. I wanted to allow the MAC. What that means is uh, whatever you see on the SKB MAC, I wanted to grab that from the SKB that you receive and encode it in a, in a TLV to send. I don't want you to use the SKB hash. I don't care what is on the SKB uh, hash value. I just want you to encode always value 10 for this policy. Uh, I want also to encode the Q mapping, SKB Q map, but I don't want it to use the one that's on the SKB. Instead, I want it to always encode a hard coded value of 17. And, to sh and I added this one here too. So the syntax of, of use is essentially an override. I know the system has this, uh, has this field, has this metadata, but I don't want it to use the system's metadata. The runtime metadata, I want it to use a static value that I set. Um, this shows how I can actually send an arbitrary field in, in the metadata. Let's say use, uh, send foobar across. Or well, whatever that means is up to you. Uh, and this shows that this is where you can do sort of load balancing. You said select the next hop MAC address by setting it. Everything is optional here. In fact, you may not have to specify any of these fields, then magically all the values will be sent. That, uh, that the system knows about. Um, so you can set the destination MAC address, the ether type, the source MAC address. And of course, uh, as I was showing there, there's a graph of this thing, so you have actions that may follow. So this is how you basically, this is how you set this part, right? So the receiver has to receive now this metadata and they have to decode it. And that's what this rule shows, right? So on the ingress side of the receiving node, you have, you look for the protocol 0x dead, which is what we set. You match on everything. I could have used a different classifier there, but 
this just uh, for my testing, this is what I use. And you say decode, and the allow syntax again that we saw before, uh, that says, uh, I want you to pick up, to set the mark that you receive in the TLV encoding and stash it on the SKB mark, right? Um, so there may be other fields there, but in this policy is saying to ignore them. Just use the SKB mark. And then when, when you're done with this, I want you to reclassify. So reclassify basically goes back to the policy rules again, and it's scanning. Now, at this point, after we've decoded, uh, the inner header shows that this is an IP packet, so we're going to go backwards, classify, and we'll match on a second rule, which is looking for protocol IP, which is of lower priority. And uh, we're now going to look for the handle, which is an SKB mark of hex 11, which is uh, decimal 17, which I had set up earlier on here. I think I had set up. Maybe not. Okay. I did. Yeah, yeah, QMAP 17. And so eventually we will run an action because that packet came encoded from the other side with that value. Right, so that's how you set it. Now, this is, I'm doing this as a human being typing TC, but you could write an app in user space that synchronizes across all machines and sets these values. Right, and that's how you end up building, like, say, a cluster of this sort. Right, you have a control app that just programs the 100 machines that exist over here, maybe another 50 that exist on each tree hierarchy there, and you're set. Um, so the wire format. Um, so as I said, this is being standardized right now. Um, we have the original packet size, um, in, uh, which is now encoded with a new Ethernet header, uh, such as you know where the MAC address that I showed you earlier on. Typically, what you do is you inherit the uh, Ethernet packet you received. So the source, destination, addresses are the same as what the original packet was. Same, uh, the only thing that you will need to change is the ether type, which we type, uh, th we're trying to get an IANA issued ether type, hex FE, FE, which stands for FE, FE communication. Um, however, if you're an admin, you can set whatever value you want there, as long as all your machines know that the value that you set, like beef, is understood by everybody. Um, there is, so, however, like I said, you can override those values. So the packet goes somewhere else. Um, uh, then the, way the little header there, which is uh, 16 bits, expresses how deep the metadata values are. So you can go up to 2 to the 16. This may, uh, I'll talk about the MTU issues afterwards. But essentially, you send this packet across the wire between the source, from the source node. And then when it gets to the uh, destination node, all this is stripped off, and you're left with that, which is the original packet that was being sent. Any questions on that? Yeah, Mike uh, from my finger. So why not just use SFC? SFC as in running over IP or no no service function chaining. Uh, you yeah, th this could you could use this to implement service chaining so if you want. Then you wouldn't have to go and get a new ether type or you just you. I don't think th those guys run over IP, right? They. It's, it's the, it is an ether type. The service. There's an ether type called service chaining. Yeah. I don't I don't keep track of those guys. I mean, no. there's like a lot of noise going on there. It's in your same community. It's the IETF. I know, but there's a lot of vested economical interests there. Um, this is being standardized. It's going to be a standard RFC, not informational. So challenges, yes, you have MTU challenges, because if you keep adding header fields and you're expanding the Ethernet packet, you are going to have a m very large packet that is going to exceed the MTU. So one of the techniques is, so there's two things. One, since we're using this internally, let's say within a VETH or uh, within containers, 
you can set your MTU to something very large, like 64K or whatever. I think the loopback device today sets it to about, the default I have on my machine is about 64K. So I can set my container connections or VM connections to be a large MTU value. Um, the, so that, that's one technique. You basically lie to the top layer that you know I have this large MTU. So, so that's one way to do it. The other way is what uh, uh, is we give you flexibility enough to say I only have 64 byte space. Therefore, I'm gonna set my MTU to be whatever my value is plus 64, and anything that exceeds that, the packet will be rejected. You get an error message. The Ethernet type we're struggling with, uh, we, we're gonna try and get one from IANA. However, um, the does not require that you get, uh, as to use a standard um, IANA derived ether type. What you could do is you own the network. This is for uh, racks level, room level processing of packet to scale things. Now you could use it for service chaining Absolutely, uh, but it's within the scope of uh, your own domain. So you could, as long as you program what the ether type should be, uh, everybody should be able to comply to that. There's a single uh, admin point, basically. So again, that's metadata. metadata. Well, how do I say to the other system that I'm sending you an SKB mark in my TLV? Do you standardize that? or do you make it proprietary? <clears throat> if you're running your own domain, I guess you need to publish it, so assuming there's more than one admin, even within your domain, someone needs to set policies. If you're doing it from a central point of view, then it's easy. If you have to interpret with another organization, then you need to change those values. You, you need to, to be consistent. What the ITF uh, Forces Working Group is, is standardizing those meta IDs. So there will be meta IDs issued, there'll be a space for uh, vendor valued meta IDs, but the key is those meta IDs need to be understood. When I say TLV, what is that T that tells me what a Q uh, mapping is or SKB hash is, or what is FUBAR, right? Uh, brings me to my next point. Uh, sometimes in, uh, in order for me to discover what uh, metadata is supported by a specific system, I have to be able to query the kernel and say, tell me uh, which metadata do you support and uh, what values I can set for it. So I have, maybe I should show some quick header file here. So if you look at the code, Here's one for SKB mark. So th there's a few things here. So at the moment I have, let's say, TLVs. I don't know if people can see that. So, so the field that has there's a few specific uh, fields that are very important for, this is future work by the way, uh, right now is still what the, the discovery part. Um, you have an ID, that's a meta ID. It's defined in some header file in Linux. You have a name, so I can, I can find that this is about QMAP, SKB QMAP. You have a synopsis, which is missing from here. Well, that's a f future idea. So I can actually query the kernel and say, um, Give me, give me the uh, ID, give me the type. Let me find something. Okay, this is better. <coughs> uh, sorry, it's a patch format, but I, th I hope you can see that. That you see the synopsis there. It tells it what. Uh, so if you're writing, what I'm hoping, to, what I'm shooting for, and I don't know if I'm gonna be successful at this, is I don't wanna rewrite, every time somebody writes a new metadata, I don't want them to rewrite any code in IP Route 2. I want them to actually query the kernel, and I want to retrieve the information to say that this is uh, SKB mark, it has a type of U32, it's, uh, 
ID is IFP, whatever this value is defined as, and it's synopsis, so I can print a help sign or something. This is very cheap because it's one per metadata, uh, metadata encoding, right? So basically, because I suspect there'll be a lot of people writing metadata uh, encoders, we just don't want to have them rewrite the uh, IP route two part. Hey, okay. Jamal, really quick. I yeah. think our goals uh, are very similar here because the, the, the flow API stuff we're working on is very similar to this, right? We want to be able to have the hardware tell you what it can support. Yes. So you know, what the types it supports, what fields, and have the tool automatically not have to update our user space every time you add a new Exactly. You know, so I, I think I was trying to, I kept telling, saying, this is what I wanted to talk to about NetConf. I just never, you guys hassled me that I never got to talk about this. Ah, that's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't get quick enough to the slide, I guess. I, but but that's that's uh, what I meant by discovery. I want to actually ask the kernel. It tells me the name, synopsis, IDs. Yeah. I mean, this is what the the stuff we're working on for the hardware does, right? We want to ask the hardware what do you right. support. Yeah. We want to ask the kernel what it supports. Yes. And then we want user space to program them coherently. Yes. Jamal. Okay. Jamal. Yeah. Did, did over here. Oh. Back here. Yeah. So. I don't know if I, if, I, if I just heard something that I, I what I think, and I just want to ask you if what I just heard the conversation was that mm -hmm. it sounds to me like the, the people that, for instance, building switch hardware that we were talking about in the previous talk are, are suddenly saying, um, wait a minute, what if, in fact, um, the communication between the switch hardware and the Linux kernel looked exactly like the communication between your two containers? That's what I thought I just heard. No, that what I no, you was talking about discoverability of the, how do I know, can I use, basically John has some similar technique to ask the hardware, what can you do for me? And so that's it was what a little more, is a little more intimate than I'm suggesting. Right. I'm suggesting that the switch hardware could look like it's a different TC classifier to uh, across that. Yeah, l l th there's some piece about hardware here. Let me just get maybe. That was my whole question. So right. I, it wasn't as, 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 I thought there was like an epiphany that just happened here, that's all. But it okay. wasn't. John, do you want to, we'll follow that up offline. Yeah, the only I thing maybe I would add is it, it's, it's, it's actually useful to be able to have your, your switch um, populate fields in the SKB and send it into the stack for, for you know, further classification. Okay, let me, what do I have next? Okay, so, so how, how do you add a new metadata extension? You basically, have to, um, where the hell is that thing? There it is. Sorry, I'm just gonna show you in patch format. Um, you basically have to create a structure of that sort. You define what the metadata IDs are. Uh, the most important thing are these methods that are supplied, you know, a check presence method, an encode, decode. Uh, user space may wanna ask you, give me your metadata, uh, give me your attributes. You have an allocation uh, method. You have a release method because if, you know you may have a complex structure. We don't want to take care of that. You just uh, so if I quickly show uh, the different methods using this patch. So here's an SKB marking code, right? So what you do is essentially um, uh, this your, your encode method will be called whenever we recognize that we not, we have to encode an SKB mark. And uh, in this case, we grab it off the SKB, and then we check if we have a static override value. If we do, then we're gonna use that value. Uh, otherwise, if this is false, we're using the SKB mark. Just that simple. As right, so for simple uh, metadata, this is very trivial, as you can see. And then, of course, we end up uh, calling the uh, encoder. Right? There's an encoder that takes it and puts it in big Indian format for sending out on the wire. Right. Uh, for the decode part, we're basically going to pass you a piece of data, which is the stripped out TLV, the data part of the TLV. You convert it to Indian, uh, to the proper in host Indianness, and you stash it to the SKB mark. Uh, and this just checks uh, if we we uh, have this value or not. It, the paper will give you more data. So write those, write this. And in the future, you don't have to write a single line of code for IP Route 2. Go ahead. So uh, at the risk of you coming here and beat me. Uh, um, 
I'll try not to. Um, this kind of uh, line <laughs> protocol for uh, um, um, serializing uh, SKB metadata might be useful for other purposes than uh, uh, quality of service or other types of quality of service that uh, are not uh, using PC. So do you see a way or a future implementation which something like this is used or implemented as a protocol handler in the uh, receive pass instead of a class action? Yeah, I just, I guess I never thought of that. But this, I have to explain that this is a forces standard, right? And in forces we have this concept of these nodes that I showed the graph thing. Right. And then we just needed to distribute them Sometimes it's a good thing when the big guys are not looking there and disrupting you. So th that's why we made progress, basically. But I can see that it will be useful. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there, there's a, actually, there's a small piece. This is where I wanted. I was <laughs> trying to get Martin to help me out on some of this. Thing. So for example, there's no doubt that you can take that metadata encoding and translate it into some proprietary format like HiGig which uh, th th there's a lot of chip-to-chip -chip, uh, interconnects that have their own thing of a ZAWI or something of that sort where you can, uh, they do encode metadata. I think, John, you're telling me you're, you guys also support some 64-bit still that I can, right. So what if I could take this and have a little proxy that actually translates between two chips using the IFE action or some other action that follows IFE action or before IFE action that encodes it into that format that the chip understands. That, that's, it's in the paper we say, we mentioned that kind of thing. And that's ha something we had to deal with. In a running implementation today, that's serving a lot of uh, fl uh, flaws, I would say. So what are the future plans? Uh, we don't have performance numbers. We do believe this is extremely fast because the latency is, say, running this or running over UDP over full this is going to be a hell lot more faster because of the amount of code that's executed. Uh, discoverability is work in progress. I've been trying to get hold of John uh, for like, John, can we talk? Okay, I have to run. But we're hopefully going to talk and maybe we'll come up with something uh, that's uh, convergent. Uh, the hardware offload. So I do believe that if I was to look at this stuff here, right, I, can, I should be able to have some hardware offload. Uh, and this could be easily demonstrated with the rocker, rocking rocker, uh, where I actually receive this in hardware, in QMU, for example, I strip off the TLVs and I attach them to DMA descriptors. So by the time they get the driver, this, uh, this DMA pointers uh, or values are already set and I can transfer them to the appropriate SKB matches or whatever. That's something that is work in progress as well. Um, what else? Oops. Yeah. I just finished these slides. I have a feeling I missed something that's in the paper. I apologize, but read the paper, send questions. I'll be posting these patches. Any questions? Nobody like this? Is anybody out there that thinks this is a really so bad thing? So what happens when you get an IA and A number? A what? When you get a, a allocated ether, ether type number for this stuff. Yeah, so that's so th I think that's one of the things I missed, right? So we said we don't want to do the VXLAN angle, you know how VXLAN guys went and um, I think one of the port numbers was used in Linux and then ITF and their wisdom decided that they want to allocate a different port number. So we allow for you to set it basically from day one. Right. So, how, how far away are you from getting a number? Is uh, close. I'm more interested. Close. But yeah. We just have to make push it to RFC. Well, why don't you just wait and see? Have that number before you add add this unnecessary at that point unnecessary flexibility to the ether type. I so in an admin sense of view, I should be able to set any value I want, like in my network. Right. And this is essentially the domain of this is sort of uh, within the scope of. Uh, a cluster, right? My cluster. This is another one of those scenarios where, from my perspective, I want to put you into the smallest box as possible, whereas you want the maximum fle flexibility. Just consider my point of view on this. Sure. Okay. Does that mean I shouldn't send the patch? I, <laughs> I think if you're going to get the value in a couple of weeks, you might want to just it's start the implementation with the fixed value, and if it 
is really <laughs> a useful feature to be able to put arbitrary types in there at it. We, we, so the ITF doesn't deal with the, IEEE, with the IEEE. There's a lot of politics. It may take I understand. a year. Right. Okay, I'll leave the decision up to you for now. Okay. okay? All right, thanks, man. All right, so that was it. Any more comments, questions? All right, thanks.